This conference so, yeah, will now be recorded. Yeah, so, um, yeah, as I said, the, what I tend to do is give a brief introduction. Um, for you, those of you not too familiar with what BIM is, I'll give you know, some general highlights of what, what BIM is and what some of the fundamentals are. Um, I'll probably provide, well, provide an update on what's happening with some of the standards and the, 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 the changes to those standards in, in, um, over the last year or so. Um, give you an introduction on who the different BIM governing bodies are because it's, it's, it's quite a complex different organisation. I would then like to introduce you to something called the RC Rail project and then um, I'll, I'll give you some, uh, some videos on the next generation of um, track design tools that are currently being re released and then give a, a demonstration on what um, we're currently using a product called iModel Hub where we're modelling uh, um, TIU. So, yes, yeah, so please feel free to drop questions into the chat. Okay, you've probably heard lots of people talking about BIM. You've probably heard that it's going to make everything better. You've probably heard it's 3D modeling. You might even heard legal experts say, who owns the model? You might have heard it's going to cost more. Well, forget what, you, forget what you've heard for just a minute and just imagine. Imagine clearly understanding our customers' requirements from the outset so we can focus accurately on what they need rather than trying to interpret what we think they want. Imagine if we could agree where information needs to be stored, how information needs to be approved, and how we could securely share that information so all parties can make informed decisions. Imagine one team appointed and working together from the outset of a project in a process they are all familiar with, without the constraints of one organization's processes impinging on another. Imagine expertise from the supply chain engaged right, right from the beginning. Imagine suppliers' profits increasing because you can do more with less resource in less time to a higher level of quality and a reduced level of risk, yet the, that the client um, receiving a project at a 50% reduced cost. Imagine if you're just finishing the design before you start construction and not having to do as built information at all. Imagine reduced operation and maintenance costs and understanding how assets are performing in real time. Imagine us putting in the best graduate talent as a first choice rather than as a plan B. Imagine our industry raising the whole GDP of the country. Imagine having a positive impact on climate change and picking the best design options based on embedded carbon, not just cost. Imagine if we can massively reduce not just our industry's carbon footprint, but the, that's of the whole nation. Yes, I'm passionate about BIM, but I'm also passionate about a whole lot more. So let's just put the BIM acronym aside for a minute and realise this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to change everything we know about our construction industry for the better. So going back to the, some of the basics, what is BIM? So BIM, as it, uh, most people know, it stands for Building Information Modeling. I think that's a horrible term and, and a horrible acronym. So the term I prefer is Better Information Management. BIM is not software. It, BIM is actually a collaborative process for developing information, managing information and delivering information in a, in a controlled process. An information model isn't just a 3D model. It also includes all graphical information, survey information, documentation, and data. Now, the government construction strategy uh, published in 2016 for 2025 set these very aggressive targets of, of reducing um, lowering costs by 30%, 50% faster delivery, 50% lower emissions, and improve export. Uh, opportunities. So BIM and digital engineering is at the heart of the strategy of how we, we would deliver these, these tough targets. 
So some of the benefits of BIM um, and how we can deliver that, we get obviously get a better interrate, greater design. It delivers the, the, the project at a reduced capital cost. We can massively reduce risk of a project and engineering out, engineering out those risks during, um, during the um, design process. We can reduce operating costs and make the, the um, built asset operate far more efficient, efficiently and with less interventions. We can increase productivity. You know, say the construction industry is one of the lowest um, uh, industries for, 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 for production. We've got a long way to go and we can get mass, massively improve this. We can increase asset availability by having to maintain it less. We make the assets available more. We can improve asset life cycle management and obviously making smarter choices about choices and materials, we can improve sustainability. Safety is, is always in our minds, and we can definitely improve safety using building information modeling. We can also generate predict predictive behavior, and from that we can implement things like machine learning and artificial intelligence on top of that. We're also building a platform for the future. So when we actually come onto things like digital twins, BIM is at, the, is at the forefront of the foundation of, of, of building digital twin. Um, BIM is not just um, for design and construction process, but it is for the, compl the complete life cycle. And if I can use the analogy of, of an artist painting a picture, when basically the artist will start off with a blank canvas, he will then may apply a color wash and then actually then start to add layer upon layer of, of paint, refining it, refine it until he's created the masterpiece. Well, BIM is very much like this. So where the project moves throughout the life cycles, the next stage is adding to the detail of its predecessor without having to start from scratch again or having to confirm or convert someone else's work. By doing things right, to the right level of detail and the right format and the right standard, we can drastically remove reduce the amount of rework and waste of the project. I apologize, this slide is, is basically from a, um, the building industry, um, but effectively it should show the same thing. So a traditional project at each different you know, grip phrase, there would always be a drop off of productivity while we finish one design and, and pick up on, on, a, on, on another. So what BIM does is allow a, a smooth, efficient handover from one phase to another by making sure all the information has been correctly checked, verified and published so we know its provenance and it's fit and it's fit for the purpose that we intend to use it for. So with a um, BIM project as opposed to a traditional project, we will tend to want to do things in a lot earlier stage and we do things more in advance. And this is often where we, we think that things often cost more because we're actually bringing a lot of the design information that you do during uh, you know, contractors design phase earlier on in the project so secondly the detailed design could be more expensive but we do actually deliver massive design changes or, or, or cost savings later on in the project and certainly by reducing contractors risk and contingency sums as a re result of doing the design earlier on to a greater level of detail so behind the um, uh, the government, the, the government's basically produced a government procurement strategy and how it actually wants to produce any built asset. And they've um, and they set this down in back in 2011, and they set up the BIM task group under the Department of Business Innovation and Skills. I think this is now 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 Bayes, but effectively they they created uh, a mandate to say that by April 2016. All projects had to be delivered to something called BIM Level 2. I'll come and talk about that in a minute. This wasn't just aimed at Tier 1 contractors, but right away throughout the supply chain as well. This led to a great upskilling with, within the, um, the, the supply chain of how to use um, BIM more effectively. This is uh, now part of the UK's in industrial strategy for growth, and so this will con contribute to um, uh, export opportunities for um, UK PLC um, at the moment. The UK currently leads the, the world in UK um, BIM adoption, 
and the UK has been um, leading the development of both the European and ISO standards in relation to in relation to BIM. So just to explain, explain some of the fundamentals, the BIM level two refers to this particular diagram. This was uh, two chaps, Mark Bew and Mervyn Richards, came up with this slide on describing where BIM maturity is. Obviously, BIM level two is just doing plain um, 2D CAD or, or, or drawings. Level one is moving slightly further on where they're either doing basic 3D geometry or moving on to what we call managed CAD, so they manage that in a, in, a, in a proper process. But the real part there was around BIM level, BIM level two, and that was defined by a set of um, British standards. And that was where the mandate was, was, was set to say that the government said we wanted to achieve everything you know, using the same um, uniform process across the construction, construction industry and everyone being at this, this more higher level of maturity. We often um, describe BIM, what we have, what we say that um, beforehand we always had levels of maturity, but that was on the previous slide. This is not to be confused with BIM dimensions. BIM dimensions is completely separate. And to describe some of these dimensions, obviously we have our 3D model, but then if we integrate other dimensions such as time, which is their fourth dimension, we can then integrate cost information. We can then in bring into all operational concepts sustainability is our seventh dimension and eighth dimension is safety so let's bring this all together so to give you a more um, graphical representation of what that is we start off with our bit model at, at, at the heart of things and then what we can do is produce our engineering drawings directly from that model we don't produce them separately so if we change our model our um, drawings would automatically be updated, published, and, and um, sent off. We also need to link our requirement specification to the model. So this is where we're going, so we're not disjointed, and we can actually make sure our requirement sort of specification are in, in a machine-readable format and links linked to the model. If we link our schedule into the, the or, 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 or plan and Gantt chart into the model, then this is what we call 4D BIM. Then by generating our bills of quantities and estimates from the, the model and from the specification, we can then link our cost information to the model, and this is what we call 5D BIM. By linking together our cost information and schedule information, we can generate um, earn value or cash flow forecasts directly together so we know where, where things are. By linking things like asset tagging to the model and the specification, we need to do obviously two things there. One, we need to make sure we tag the, the piece of equipment performing that duty. And we also need to link back to the original specification. So if the, if the piece of equipment changes, we at least know what its, what, what its functional purpose was at the, at the, um, when, it, when it was designed. We also can produce our visualizations and fly throughs and walkthroughs and things like that, which all link back to the original model. And then if we take our cost information and schedule information, we can do things like e-procurement of where we can put together tender packages or, or materials packages together directly driven from the model itself. We can also do things like financial reporting and business intelligence, um, all based around um, uh, the model. And of course, we've also got health and safety. The impact on health and safety by using 3D techniques and planning can seriously save lives. But, you know, there's certainly been recent incidents that, you know, through better planning and 3D visualizations and taking opportunities through how the site is going to be oper operated and giving them videos of exactly the procedures of how things are going to work on site could say, definitely save lives. Moving on then, we can actually take on board what we call off-site man off manufacture. And there's some called, uh, a process called design for manufacture and assembly. So when we're actually thinking about our design, we're not just thinking about how it looks at the end of the day, but we're actually making sure 
we can um, embed off-site manufacturer in, into our design uh, design process and again make sure we do as much off-site as, uh, as possible and bring site size and assemble things in a, in a quick list quick and easy things to do we then obviously can link things like um, uh, construction planning schedule planning um, and so and hold our design reviews all around a single model and so we just started doing this on on TU at the moment so yeah, that so hopefully shows you how things, once we, we start off with a model, well, then we can start connecting in other different services together. But the fundamental building blocks of what we need about every, every asset, we need a consistent way of describing what something is. We need to describe where it is, what it's connected to, when something's going to happen, and what are the costs. These are the core fundamentals that we've, we're, we're going to need. At that stage, I'm happy to um, pause while I have a quick slurp of water to see if any, any questions are on, on some of those those fundamentals. So has anything come through yet, David? Or Nothing nothing in the chat as such. Has anyone got any uh, questions at this stage? I, I've got one, just about the, the level of technology needed to, to support this uh, software. Laptops, do you need super laptops? Yeah, no, at, at the moment, I mean, there's, there's people um, Karen and the, the um, design work, they probably need a slightly more powerful um, laptop to do some of the design to do some of the design work. But the way things are going now, everything's moving into um, cloud computing, so all the processing powers actually up there in, in in the cloud, not on your home PC. So um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, certainly my I, my British uh, sorry my network rail laptop is a very um, poor. Thing and it, most things run on that uh, quite readily. So I think yeah, that's it's we don't need a huge amount. Obviously, large screens help, um, but that's yeah. I think most the way things are changing now that you should be able to use, you know, an iPad or, or a small smaller device, you know, either out on site or you know a, a desk a desk station, which is just a, a normal yeah. You know, your, your PC at home is normally powerful enough to, to run this type of stuff now. Uh, so there's a question from. Uh... Uh, Stuart C, do you want to unmute yourself or do you want to, uh, I can read it out if, if you can't. So I, 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 can, I don't know if you can see the, the comment there. Has any thought got into the effect of increased specification early in the process? Uh, locks, locks things in, making them harder and more expensive to change later. Yeah, so it's not so much... Um where you should be doing it, because when you move move forward now into what's ob object design a lot of all your designs and specifications are already knitted together so it's simply you're select selecting a component from a library and dropping it into your design by doing that you also should bring in the specification to that component and that design at the same time the building industry is doing this um, uh, very well at the moment within the rail and infrastructure industry we are you know behind this this type of thing at the moment and again the the key thing about that is once you've dropped a generic component in into your design then product manufacturers can actually then see you know that you're using a generic a, a generic component that they can then um tender for and based on that to make sure that you know this is this is the specification of the product we want our products even meet that requirement or don't meet that requirement and we you know, the process we're working at the moment is to digitally match those products to the specification. Does that answer your question? I, I reasonably so. I'll take it probably just a different side of it. Is, is, the, is there a danger of locking down the specification too early, not uh, provide the designer for the opportunity to, to, to get to a, a more uh, uh, innovative solution? Yeah, I think I think um, one of the things we we should we will move towards, especially with machine learning, is that we should rather than considering I don't know, 10, 15 different design options, we should be running thousands, if not millions, of different design options based on automation, and that's certainly one thing that could you know greatly enhance the the, the design and where you get in, innovation come along that can actually change fundamentally the way we we look at things and things like that then i i think that that will come i don't think we're we're there yet um wow. but i certainly think you know that's, that's one way we can um, yeah move things forward 
Okay, no, that, that's that's useful. Thank you, Lawrence. I don't know if you want to uh, I'll mute myself and continue. Okay, sure. Okay, so the, um, the the previous British standards were, were um, based on something called um, BS eleven ninety two, and these are these are the standards here. So the first one was you know the general collaborative production of um, engineering construction information. We then had what we call the various different PASIs, public available available specifications that defined um, the different phases. So we had one for yeah, the green one there is for design and construction. The orange one was for operation and maintenance. The white one next. Lawrence, I've lost you. I don't know if anyone else has. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, back sorry, yeah, you off Can you hear me? Yes. Lawrence, it might yeah, be sorry, I've got a slight technical problem with my um, um I think if you just maybe switch the video off and maybe just go um audio only. Lawrence you still with us? I'll just try and contact him, just bear with me. Yeah, Thank I can you. hear you now, Dave. All right, brilliant. Excellent. Okay, continue. Thank you. Maybe just switch your video off, Lawrence. Might, might help. Yeah, it's, 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 I think I'll do that. Um, yeah. Okay, that's gone. Thank you. Yeah. Right, so, um, yeah, so the, the next standard we have, we, there's, there's the blue standard there is to do with information security. So if we we're doing things like a, a station design, we need to put in place a secure, robust process around who who's able to see um, the information and how we how we share it. And there needs to be a proper risk assessment done. You know, things like we don't want things like video camera positions falling into the wrong hands. So um, yeah, we, we, there's a, there's a standard related relating to that. Um, the two at the bottom there, one's like a BRIM protocol document, that one deals with all things like intellectual property and who owns the model and the rights to the model and the sharing of information, who has the rights to change it. And the other one there is to do with government soft landings and it doesn't really apply to the rail industry, but this is trying to aim aimed at when we hand over an asset from the contractor who's built it across to the operator and maintainer. There is a, the, um, a process of handover where effectively the contractor takes on board the operation and maintenance for a for an initial period to make sure that they have fully documented and handed over the asset um, in an inappropriate appropriate way to make sure all the asset and the documentation is in place and it's simply just not cut off and thrown over the fence like you know many projects are and you know and people leave the project and no inf asset information is handed over. Right. Uh, yeah. So, just over the last last year, um, some of these standards are being withdrawn. So, especially the standard that re refers to what BIM level two is. Our European colleagues really didn't like the term BIM levels or BIM levels of maturity. So, all those have been withdrawn, and these new ISO standards, ISO nineteen six fifty. Um, one and two have been introduced. So, so where that we have this, so the government construction industry mandating BIM level two. Unfortunately, we no longer have a BIM level two. That's gone because of the new the new um, standards have been put in place. Now, fortunately, the people who wrote the ISO standards were um, all from the UK, and a lot of them were very much the contributors to the original British standards. So they're very much written in a similar. A similar way, but I say they're now being they've now been internationally recognised and, um, and and adopted at uh, ISO European European level. Yeah, so fun fundamentally, these two standards have been replaced by these three new ISO standards. Um, so and level uh, so the ISO standard. 9650-0 is some guidance notes on the adoption 
of those two um, standards. In addition to those standards, there's something we have decided to adopt in the UK as a uh, global classification standard. And this is basically how we describe assets from a variety of different sources. The issue we have is that you know we have things like the rail method of measurement and um, things uh, and how we, we design things and how we, we plan things, all using different classification standards. So we can't actually therefore compare apples with apples. And you know, we also have the same same problem in network rail with um, using our ellipse system, how we use oper operation and maintenance. And it's really important that we have a, a way of identifying what something is in a variety of different systems and platforms. And now um, what we're trying to do within um, the UK BIM community now is use Uniclass and Uniclass 2015 to describe our assets and documents and how we, we pull things together. So, um, so effectively at the heart of it is a list of these different tables that we were able to describe the different entities within a railway and always have the different codes to them. But we then therefore need to bring these together in a, um, say, a, a, a consistent, consistent format. The other thing we, we do um, is trying to make sure we have a common process across all projects. Now we're running into a bit of problems here at um, Network Rail because Network Rail has its own its own processes. So we're trying to blend together what the um, BIM mandated processes are to the way Network Rail does things. Um, and uh, it, yeah, I've got to say it's, it, it's a bit of a challenge, but this outlines the, the main process of how we, we would um, pull our uh, project documentation together. So the top level there, you know, this, this would happen from the, the asset maintainer. They would um, provide us what company standards we need, need to work to and a document called the asset information requirements that basically specifies this is the information that we want about our newly procured assets. So from that, we would develop a document called plain language questions. And that would just give in very simple terms, what is the purpose of the information we are providing? So if you do provide information during, during the, um, the, the project, it needs to be able to answer the plain language question it was set to establish. So um, yeah, so you may have heard the term employer's information requirements or, uh, or exchange information requirements. This is where we set out at um, an early stage the exact information we want the contractors to hand back to us in, in um, very uncertain terms. So it goes down to what software they should use, what coordinate system they should use, what level of information, what level of detail. We ask some questions about how they're going to manage health and safety with the use of use of use of BIM, how they're going to do scheduling. So it's quite specific questions during the, the tender phase. And then the ten the during the tender, the um, suppliers will respond in some a document called the BIM e execution plan, um, where they they would obviously um, say how they're going to meet the requirements of the um, of the EIR or the employer's information requirements. So with that, they will produce a complete schedule of every information deliverable. So that could be every drawing, every model, every um, every specification and define when that information is going to be delivered, who's going to deliver it, what format is that information going to be delivered in, and um, what, what level of detail and what information is going to be given. So that gives you the complete information schedule. That obviously needs to tie into the master project plan as, as well to make sure that we all hand that information back. So we, you know, that's, um, and with that, that's what we call the project information model, all the information we will use throughout the project. So a handover, we would have a, a clearly defined set of processes and um, documents and attributes that we, we've set out in the implies information requirements that we hand across back to the maintainer in terms of this form of an asset information model. And so the asset information model is both you know, your 3D model, it's your documentation and any data that you want associated with that. So that's, that's sort of the overall process that all BIM projects should, should should follow. 
So obviously we're, we're, we're um, very much trying to implement that now within um, within Northern programs. Okay, moving on next now to the various different bodies that um, are uh, managed BIM throughout the UK and also wider afield. The top right hand corner there is, is the UK BIM Alliance. Um, and this organisation is, is um, basically run by a set of volunteers from, from industry. And we make sure that you know it's all the leading consultants and contractors are part of it. We've also got things like the ICE, um, uh, um, RICS, all, all part of the UK BIM, BIM Alliance, effectively making sure that how um, BIM is going to be managed within the UK. They've written some you know, fantastic guidance notes, so I very much encourage you to, to go and look. And they also hold regular events or they have you know, regional events and they also have subject, subject matter events as well. So things like there is a BIM for RAL um, uh, group. So anyone's interested in you know, how, how BIM has been used in the railway, I would certainly recommend going that, that together. Um, bottom, bottom right hand corner, you've also got the, the, um, the BSI, British Standards. They're responsible for developing the, the British Standards and um, together and also feed into the development of the ISO standards. Over the last two to three years now, you've had an organisation set up by Bayes at Cambridge University called the Centre for Digital Group Britain. And they are the arm for developing all research and development into um, BIM and technology. And um, so you know, between them, that's um, all formulates together. They are also responsible for developments called the um, uh, digital twin strategy and how we're going to develop a national digital twin for the whole of the UK, not just for, for rail, but for roads and utilities and public wellbeing, public spaces, um, open spaces, so in, environment all tied in together. So we, you know, that's that's the overall objective. At the international level, there's something called um, an organisation called Building Smart and all the industry experts collaborate together on that so you know there's so we all get together on a, on, a, on a regular basis and we're trying to develop the open standards for BIM as you know so we're not tied to a particular vendor or a particular country's way of way of doing things so so between us we're, we're trying to develop those, those standards and again there is a UK chapter um, for building smart and we have a, um, a, a rail group for that that we're, we're looking to Trying to try and establish. Okay, so what I was going to do now is, is move you on to um, play a video. So hopefully, this, this, the sound and audio comes comes through. So this is some of the next generation of track design tools that um, uh, Bentley, obviously the leading infrastructure sort of um, BIM experts at the moment. Um, Oh, have, have produced so yeah this, this is a short video clip on um how to design some, uh, a new track alignment um based based on a product so let me just play this to see if it's, uh, if it works david could you just tell me whether you can hear the video sound when it plays creating yes. cars in open road design i can hear that yes thank you okay. geometry created and my 2d view is in view one i've got a 3d view showing my 3d geometry in view three and view seven I've just opened uh, for future cross sections. So to create a corridor, I go to new corridor, I locate the geometry, I can reset the active profile. Now I can give the corridor a name. So this is my design corridor. I can select a template, where do I want the template to start and where do I want to end. I could go to the end or I could key in a known value, a template drop interval, and then it's just accept and the model will be created. So I have now 2D graphics, my 3D model. I'm just window to here and I could so I see my sections at the start and I could step through 
each section. I could come in and turn on my cut and fill graphics as well as my values. Or I could locate via the plan. Again, I'm stepping through and you see on my 3D view, the section line as I'm cutting through 3D model and the volumes changing accordingly. Okay, so that's, that's um, one little video there. I'll just, I'll just close it a second. Creating corridors in open row designer. Oh, sorry. sorry. There's a second video here. Design changes within open row designer. So we have again our 2D view on the left and our 3D model on the right hand side. So what happens if the geometry changes? What happens to our corridor? Um, so let's try a couple of examples. If I zoom in to my template area on my 2D view here. I can see a start change. Let's just make this 4300. When I accept that, notice the model is updated in the 3D view. Maybe I need to change the, the offset dimension. In our initial example, we were minus 20. Let's make it minus 30. So here you can see on the right hand side, 3D model is updated and take into account the new offset dimension and the new turnout position. Okay, so I'll give you some, uh, um, an overview of where some of the design tools are going. Well, I've just um, got a copy of, a copy of these from uh, YouTube. So if you do go to YouTube and just um, put in um, uh, Bentley Open Rail, you will see lots of different videos of how this uh, design software can be used for all sorts of um, uh, track design options. It does all your the spirals and, and, and uh, yeah, your cants and things like that. So it's you know really really sophisticated and, and uh, complex to, um, design tool. And yeah, you know, I think you know, using tools like this can actually one one obviously reduce the time to actually produce some of those designs. But obviously, when you actually want to compare one option against another and what the outcomes are, you know, then it's very easy to do that. Um, uh, you're comparing one option against against another. Sorry, is this a convenient point? There's a couple of questions in the chat. Do you, do you want to take those at this point? Yeah, go 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 ahead, David. Okay, so uh, we'll probably do them in reverse. So I think I think man to answer the question itself. But Phil Ramson, was is this Open Rail? Is a question? Is this the software that they promoted? Yes, this is this, 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 yeah. this is Open Rail. When I say this, this is um, I say I, I have no allegiance or affiliation with with with, with Bentley, but I say this this is some of the, you know, the design software that they are they are using. So this replaces what used to be called Bentley Rail Track, and Open Rail is the next generation. So. Um, yeah, it's sort of interfaced with MicroStation, but it's it, it's it's the the level above MicroStation that would allow you to do that. And is this is available it, now? Is it? Please, please forgive yeah, me. Yes, this is available now, and so we will be piloting this on 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 TRU. Okay, uh, Andrew Hurst has a question. He said, "My experience with BIM is the base data is never correct in terms of an existing railway site." When you're trying to fit equipment and parts into a virtual uh, environment that is correct, and that then you are trying to fit uh, equipment and virtual uh, fit equipment and, pa and parts into a virtual environment that is incorrect. How do we deal with this issue moving forward? As it wastes a lot of time and and money working. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Working, sorry, very, very, very good question. So, and say so that it's right when we do designing stuff in green fields. Um, yeah, it's quite straightforward to use these tools. But what we need to do is capture what's what's on the ground. And the way we we do that, we're obviously we've now got um, point cloud scanning te um, techniques that are available, so we can get millimeter perfect um, recognition of where assets are. And the second thing now, there is something called context capture. 
so the software can automatically recognize each different asset type so one would get a positional fix of what something is and therefore actually also recognizing what that asset is so you know um if we've got an axle counter or something like that we will recognize that or we have to recognize what type of signal or something is and put it accurately in a, in a, in a particular place yeah you know, things like your um route geometry and things will be very much precise um yeah so some of the issues we have is some of our mileage markers out on, out on site of um they're very hit and miss um but you know by okay. using cloud check Got technology them. we should get millimeter perfect models couple more questions and then we'll move on so uh out of it there's a question here are, are the asset information set in the tools such as type of rail what sleepers how much ballast etc yeah, so again, that depends very much on, on the model. So we would take, you know, with Network Rail, we, we would take that information directly out of Ellipse. And we should, you know, if someone's put the information in correctly, we should be able to retrieve that, that information um, correctly. So yes, we at a very, this is where referring back to my artist and painting the level of detail, at a very early stage, you wouldn't have that level of granularity. As the design progresses deeper and deeper, then yes, you would update your model with those attributes of what the type of ballast you would put in, and what type of sleeper is, or what type of clips you would you 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 would be using. So you haven't got to do that on a individual sleeper basis. You can say between this mileage and for this change and this 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 change, then all sleepers are of this type, and check and update it as one based on based on the rail centre line. So yeah, the, the the software will generate every single sleeper for you. You just need to plot in the, the center line and tell it what the, what the um, the right attributes are for those sleepers. Okay, thank you. And last one, uh, Gavin Jenkins. Um, many projects uh, have a fluid set of requirements due to external influences, e.g., stakeholder consult consultation that can't be all captured at project inception. How does this feed into the BIM uh, project? Uh, management model yeah so um at each different stage you do have to review your information requirements at that particular stage to see whether they're still relevant again with CRU we're doing exactly that that process so our process is is changing um from grip three to grip grip four so we're reviewing those requirements and then we're creating an, an addendum to say okay these are the additional requirements that we have for, for grip four and therefore okay. the contractors to change crop there's another question but we'll, we'll we'll move on now and capture some more later on if that's okay have you got is that yeah, okay sure. Lawrence? yeah, yeah no problem okay so um at an international level we, what we're trying to do is give a complete digital representation of how a railway network is put together so this is describing every sing, every single component within a railway within a structured within a structured format, and this is um, an awful lot of work being done by an awful lot of people from around the world. Unfortunately, within the UK, we have very poor representation. So this is very much being driven by um, China, Korea, um, Switzerland, Germany, and within the UK, we haven't had much representation. So um, yeah, I'm looking to you know, say if anybody wants to get involved with the um, the RFC rail projects, then you know please get in get in contact, and we say we certainly want more um, domain experts work, working for the, the the UK arm to you know make sure we don't have this post. But effectively, where this has come from, all BIM modeling software and um, asset management software in the future will be based on this IFC rail design. Um, and this, what we're trying to do is make sure that this standard is a complete open standard and we don't hand it across to people like Bentley to come and say, right, you can only use our tools, our products. We want to make sure we've got an open um, platform to do it. So that's the IFC uh, rail project. So basically that breaks it down into you know, how we structure a project. We then have various different spatial concepts, you know, um, things like Canton alignment, functional elements component elements and then we would have a common set of attributes um, relating to each different asset or component component type so if we were to, for instance look at the spatial example um, we would then to say we, we break down our 
um, railway in, in, into, into different designs. So we've got the line, uh, line side equipment, uh, line side equipment, the railway superstructure, railway substructure, and then we will break it down into, uh, you know, th th things like the um, uh, how we would define things like um, turnouts and things. So again, we're making sure we have a whole digital schema that we can represent any railway network um, and any rail component that, that's put together. So again, we'd, we're very much early early stages of this, but the same. Um, other other um, components such as you know ports, highways are uh, doing the same thing. Building industries very much again ahead of us in this, but we're using the same sort of data schema to see where we can um, catch up with this type of thing. So just give you another example. Um, yeah, so this is where the de um, defined concepts. So we've got things like uh, the geometry and positioning, where we deal with things like cantilement, linear placement, swept area geometry. Um, uh, spatial structures. We've got the high-level um, breakdown type structure of a, of a of the railway. So whether it be ELR uh, mileage and then the individual individual changes, and then we can look at um, different built elements, um, each element and component, and how we design and put that together. And then the functional part as well. So effectively, it was making me sure when I was coming back to my original building blocks, when we need to say what something is, where something is. Um, what's it connected to? It's a type of similar type of principle to that. So even though we know things like um, you know, so for instance, take a, take a, um, a signal, even though it could be in a completely different geographic location, we know it could be connected to the overall signaling or power system or something along those lines to make sure that we have those three or four different elements all, all lined up in place. Yeah. Um, okay. That's um, yeah. That's sort of about the IFC. Rail projects. Again, I'm happy to pause there if there's anything else before I jump on to um, our model hub. Uh, there's a couple of questions. So Stuart C mentioned Bentley uh, are so good at showing demos that incorporate the changes they thought of. However, their ideas lock things down in a way uh, such that you're almost forced to throw away your entire design away when you're uh, when you want to make changes they haven't thought of. How are we expected to? Uh, already be using this product? Are we expected to already use this product? Something like that? I think I think it's kind of a lockdown mechanism. No, what I'm saying is that this that this product is the next generation. It's not what we're using today. You know, we would tend to be using standard microstation now as we are today. But certainly the productivity we can um, use use going forward that we you know we very much see these these tools being you know um, the way the way forward. Because where it allows you to do, you know, rather than actually drawing lines on it um, within CAD, you're actually modeling them for objects. You're picking objects from a library. So, for instance, you pick a sleeper, you, you, you know, pick a, um, it's already got in standard libraries for things like uh, your turnouts and your specifications and your, your line speed tables already built in based on your uh, national rail standards. So, once they're developed once, then each individual designer can simply pick the right components. From the library and drop it into their design without having to go back to first principles and draw draw it for themselves. So yeah, I think yeah, it, it, I think it's it's very much the future around object based design. But again, I think we you know this is not where we we currently are at the moment. The product is available, but I think we 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 do need to be cautious around you know, and, and parlous in it first. But rather actually just saying what well, we want everyone to to use open rail. We need to make sure that we um yeah we we know each product's limitations. Okay, and another question, uh, uh, Advin, is it the intention for the rail uh, design tool to be used after design, such as containing information on track geometry, track stiffness, maintenance, etc., or is the intention to, I think, it's export the information after design into another tool to contain, yeah. contain such information? Very good and relevant question. So at the moment, we are doing a lot of good work in in design. Uh, and construction around building uh, building these BIM models. Within Network Rail at the moment, we have nowhere to hand across these BIM models to at the moment. ACES still want the basic data to input, you know, basically a, a spreadsheet format and hand it across to the asset maintainer. So the conversations we're having at the moment with TRU and Eastern Region is what are you going to do if you're interested in, in having a digital twin of the railway we're producing one more through design and construction 
but you very much need to step up and make sure you've got a team capable of receiving and using that digital twin for operation and maintenance that they don't currently have. Okay, I think yeah, I think there's a couple of other comments in there, but they're more statements than questions. So if we can move on, Lawrence, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, so just just bring you on now to something we we are using. We're just starting to release um, an iModel Hub, and it's probably my most scary part. I'm going to do is is probably do a live demonstration of this at the moment. So hopefully everything will work and uh, work well. But I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah, so iModel Hub is effectively the control centre for all BIM models. So there'll be hundreds, if not thousands, of BIM models produced on TIU. And where iModel does is allow you to bring all these different models together in a coordinated way, and also allow you to track the various different changes that happen between the models. And this is very much the platform we are using to try and build the digital twin of TLU. So again, it basically maintains a ledger of all changes that happen on the model. So at any point in time, you, you can compare one version against another or roll forward a, um, a design or back, a back, of, back of mine, a design and gives you a complete audit trail. It integrates directly with our um, uh, project-wise commendation environment. So, you know, and it, the, the process that we would have about design altering and approving uh, our different models is still very much in place. We don't have to do anything different but we can take those models and join them all up, all, all up together. So the digital infrastructure or the ecosystem we are um, trying to put together. So I've got my pin working. Uh, yeah, so very much at the heart of this, we have what we call a central data warehouse. So this is where we would have all our asset attributes and data um brought together and we will then uh link that to our common data environment or project wise so and then within tru we also have things like a gis system that, that shows you all the different mapping and and, and things together uh, called project mapper and we also have a database called track record that holds all the asset data relating to the assets on the project and um, we, again we're interfacing back to things like ellipse and cars to make sure that we can extract the information out of there on a on a regular basis so we've got a, a live feed directly from so those, those those systems we're not doing hand back at that stage because the hand back is very much a limited uh uh yeah limited make, 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 must go through a control cold process we're also bringing things in like um, uh, safety information. So we've got uh, all our hazards. Um, we we um, pull from the national hazard records. We also pull things like buried services across to our, our model, and we can join all these things up um, up together. So that this is you know, the right of it is what we call here is the I model hub, which is effectively our control center of bringing everything everything to, together. <clears throat> So what it actually gives us, it brings all models together into what's called a federated um, model, and it brings together all discipline models into a single a single place. So we can very much detect what are the interfaces between one discipline and another. We can undertake things automatically if you'd like um, clash detection. Um, we can therefore undertake virtual design reviews because we want to bring all the information together we can then help the design information to make sure the designs are, um, are fully coordinated. We have visibility of all hazards across the routes, and it also has the ability of raising and tracking issues. So once you have a design review, you can say, well, okay, well, this doesn't quite align with you know, our thinking, what we're doing for, um, for, for permanent way. You can raise an issue with that and then resolve those out in a tracking coordinated, coordinated way rather than sticking things on a, on, a, on a spreadsheet and emailing around the office. It gives you a lot more um, visibility on that. Um, with TRU, we also, um, there's lots of other work going on in, in, in the north, such as the interfaces with HS2 and NPR. And again, we're making sure we can overlay 
the different designs across from NPR and HS2 over our TRU map to know where their interfaces are. And again, really important about getting, making sure we get things really coordinated. Um, Department of Transport are particularly interested in what we're, what we're doing here. So, you know, we've got ongoing meetings with Department of Transport just to show the visibility of these three major programmes in the north of how we're going to be um, properly coordinated um, between ourselves. Right. This is um, a picture of our model hub. So I've put these up basically so I, um, I had a full back position before I went into the live demonstration, but this is um, uh, Leeds, Leeds Station. And it, you know the different colours um, basically indicate what's what's new, what's be, you know, what's being added, what's been what's been um, removed, and give you a sort of a um, fairly detailed de uh, design. So again, this is a fully coordinated model for all the various different disciplines. Again, this is this is a fairly early early stage at the moment because I say we're only fairly what group four, group five in some areas. So as the the design model will, will increase. The level of granularity and the level of information that we have would all be put across here. So um, you can see, so somewhere here we can see like these are these are the services that we have in ha have in place down here. You know, overhead things. Here we've got gantries. We've got the the, you know, the, the stops, all at various different levels. And again, as that design of that uh, the main station complex will progress, we can bring that in. We are not limited to just Bentley software for this. We can bring in things like Revit and Autodesk files or, or any other any other type of de, um, design files as well. And iModel Hub is also based on um, uh, a complete open open standard. So yeah, we don't we're not necessarily tied directly to um, uh, Bentley, for, Bentley for this. Automatically do things like. Um, Riser issues. So this is an example of just you know, highlighting a particular issue that, that, that that's um, uh, may have caused. We can you know, draw a cloud around it and then raise an issue issue point against it, and we can track those those, those issues issues going going forward. This is an example where we've actually listed all the hazards and overlaid the hazards on on the TRU um, railway. Um, yeah, to make sure we, you've got that. You know, anybody, anybody's aware of all sort of you know, hazard buried services, confined spaces, anything that's um, of, of, of relevance that we need to make everyone aware of, both designers and, um, and officers. And again, this is one of the areas I, th I think we could massively improve safety just by um, making sure people, people are aware. This is a, an example of where um, we've got a, a tunnel section going in here. Um, and on the right hand side, we've then got a, um, a, a URL or a link that basically links through to our asset asset database. So therefore, we, once we've actually say identified an asset, well, then we can start capturing the asset data against um, each different asset. So this is obviously like the, the, um, the tunnel here. So on the right hand side, we've got all the various different attributes we need to capture about this this type of uh, tunnel, and we can do that. You know, say from a very high level from Things like you know, whole things like tunnels, or right the way down to granular levels like you know, track and clips and uh, you know, um, actual counters and things. So we need need to capture all the right the right level of data for each thing. To back this up, we are developing what's called a data dictionary. So against each asset type, we are developing the data we need to collect against each each different asset asset type for that. And that's that that's um, uh, yeah work work in progress. But again, a high level through to a, a detailed level. Okay, let's see if I can get this fired up and work live. Yeah, there we are. So this is um, the key interest is all this all this model now is based in in the cloud so you haven't got to download it to all machines so these these models are actually you know vast and we've actually got the model for the whole of tru knitted together now as as the various different designs um happen so you imagine that's that's quite a, a substantial model but again we sh uh, we should be able to go in and uh zoom into you know quite quite a low, low level we're able to select a different asset and get some information about that particular uh, asset and what the details are. Um, yeah, find out some information. Again, once if 
with that asset type is linked to a database, we should be able to go off and link, link, link to find that, that record about that particular um, asset. As I said before, there's a complete hierarchy in, in, in place of each different asset and component as it, as it changes. So if, you know, for instance, the design for this overhead gantry um, uh, changed for any point in time, we wouldn't need to rebuild our model. We would just bring in that latest design of that gantry straight in, into this model. And you say, you can sort of see here how each different, you know, very, this is very hard, at least the central, we then have various different, all our different civil models, and there's all different civil models are there. Within each civil model, we would then have various different elements and components that we, we can drill, drill down in. Yeah, so there's a whole sort of hierarchy of it. Have one element is based upon um, based upon another. So that sort of gives you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, shall I pause there for a couple more questions? Um, yeah, just a general. I mean, Lawrence, have you got many more slides, or what was the plan? Uh, one, one short video yeah. to play, which I think. Okay, gives... great. Shall, shall I just go, go through and do that and then we can have the yeah, overall Yeah, we can wrap. go for that one. We'll do a closure at the end. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So once you've actually built the um, once you've actually built the model, the, the challenge is then, well, how do we um, get through and use it use it on site? And this, this little video here is a really good demonstration of something called triple site vision of how we can then take the model out on site. Hey, Mark. Uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, sir. Uh, you're out on site there, buddy. Yeah, we've, we've just arrived um, at the west side of IPC Birmingham, Sassbridge 13. Uh, and I believe I'm going to show you uh, foul cap abutment, uh, rail access stairs, and some sheet files. Uh, cool. Um, I'll just to let you know, I'm in the office uh, at the moment, so I can't get to site. It'll take me for a, a good three hours to get there, so I'm glad you're calling in. Okay. No problem. Uh, I'll just uh, switch over to um, Site Vision now. Let me just get that up. Yeah, I can see you've got your satellite there already. Yeah, so you can see that the satellite's good and I just need to orient it now, so I'm going to be walking uh, 10 metres forward. In the distance over there, that's uh, that's Neil. So this this model that's currently that's just the utilities in the area. Yeah. And I know you're not looking through the, through the device. I know you've got it to waste time. Yeah. So, so Neil is he's he's my lookout on site, making sure everything's safe. But I don't step if you uh, any dropping reeds or anything. So um, I read all the electricity cables that you've got running there at the moment. Yeah, so red, red are the HV cables. Uh, the white ones are just any other utilities, for example, like water pipes uh, or anything else, like dropping roofs, that type of thing. Yeah, okay then. So where's going to go? So uh, we'll load up another, uh, the next model. So Neil, right, okay, that's I can see that now. I can see that you put there's no Andrail on there. Though is a, that's one thing you need to pick up with the design team. But I suspect yeah. that. I'll take the sheet files off. Yeah. And you can see it there. But yeah, you're right. There's no no handrail. Um, would you like me to record that as a as an issue that needs to be taken yeah, off? Yeah, yeah. Do a, do just point at it, please, with your camera, and then there. Uh, uh, take a screenshot of it uh, to do. Okay. And roll. I mean, the designer may turn around and say, actually, uh, it's going to be added on it. It doesn't. It's just to set it out, so it might be just doing doing works that are not actually needed, but at least you recorded it. Yeah. So that's. Uh, I'll send that to you now. Your email address is there. Um, Thank you. Saved. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, file cap abutment, uh, rail access stairs, and then I'll turn the sheet files back on. Okay, then. So if you could just uh, turn around, please. So, uh, uh, 
practically not turn around so I can see the car park, I can see the substation and the fuel, uh, yeah. you can see the site layout, I get her, keep moving around, yeah, see the team working up there, you can see the lookout. Yeah. Yeah, so just turn the model off there, so you, uh, or, or use a transparency actually, Neil, just so to, to glance through it. Right, cool. So now I've got a, a general, that's it, just fade it in and out a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah. Right, cool. Now I'll bring it up so I can just see it. Right, that's cool. Right, so I can see that there. So then, them other steps that were there. Is it is there a reason why that that didn't actually the top of the stairs? Look at the blue at the top of the stairs. Why yeah. that didn't to actually tie into the existing gap instead of making uh, a new hole? Can, yeah, we not, not, can we not utilize that platform and move to that edge and ask that question? Did you get that, Mark? What Neil said? Something about that's the abutment's putting up to it. Yeah, that's part of the demolition. Uh, that's part of the abutment. So I think those that part is going to go. There you go. There's a perfect question that's been answered. Right, brilliant. Thank you very much for that. No problem. Yeah. So that's I'm 200 miles away, well, 150 miles away from you guys, and that worked. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Okay, everyone, that um, sort of concludes um, what I had today um, for presentations. Um, yeah, happy to take any any questions. Is there anything that's um, still outstanding? Uh, there was one from Andrew Hurst who, who noted about that BIM is very much locked into Bentley. Which is very expensive, especially for smaller suppliers. You, I think you mentioned this during the, the there's different formats yeah. that we can use. Is that right? Yes. So what we're trying to do, this, this is what the IFC rail project's about, is that we have a complete open standard, the same same way that you, you made, the um, internet was developed, so that we, you know, there was HTML that was, yeah, uh, um, you know, Chris Berners Lee developed and it made made it complete open standard and go to everyone. This is what the IFC RAL project is trying to do is to make sure there is a complete industry open format that any software vendor could do so we're not tied into um, organised such, like um, such as Bentley. So that's the other. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, there are, I think it's probably we've just gone a little bit over time. I know people are leaving and they've, they've sent some positive notes about the presentation that will be shared to others, but I'll just work through these uh, questions uh, work to the end if that's okay, Lawrence. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark Bailey asked, uh, how does iModel Hub work with HDMS? I think that's an e e e b e b system. Um, right, yeah. So it's e e b is um, enterprise Yeah, I, I think um, I don't know at this stage. E b tends to be used for um, asset management and keep the, the records from that at the e at the, at the end. Um, yeah, I'll probably have to get back to Mark on that. So uh, there was a question. Uh, I've read again. It was it was asking questions about storing a standardised way of storing things like material information and other information uh, that go beyond three D itself. Yeah. So again, BIM isn't just about three D. It's also around all types of document um, management. So yes, in terms of having a a um, making sure documents are stored with the right attribute information. And even coming back to things like Uniclass, Uniclass has a list of document types. So if you have the list of document type, you then have what the geographic location code of where that should be. Then between that, you, you, know, you should be able to identify a, a correct storage mechanism within ProjectWise or, or EB of how that information should be stored. But what we're again trying to do is use that model to be able to treat, retrieve that information. So if you want to be, you know, you pick a, an element of, of track and then we want to find a particular do a document that refers to that track or that type of track, that's where you should be able to retrieve it. And, and again, we just changing the mindset rather than actually listing through folders that we do on project wise at the moment is to be able to access documentation directly from the model. So okay. It's, it's, I'll take a last couple, I think. Uh, so, Andrew, is again, I think, uh, what is the process for getting the as-built data back into BIM, the BIM model? Yeah, so uh, the process needs to be properly set out within the employer's information requirements. 
the the way that network round does it is the amp process at the moment but i think the amp process needs to be revised in terms of some of the advancements we've got in, in terms of bim and asset asset management um but yeah i think yeah what we're trying to do is is make produce a information model and be able to hand a whole of that information model back to the asset maintainer as a live entity that they will continue to maintain that's what's happened on things like Crossrail. There's not just, you know, get it back in, in, into a database. We're handing across a whole um, you know, a BIM model back to the asset maintainer. So we do need to change our processes. Sir. Uh, one about from Stuart about uh, what are the plans for making sure that everyone uh, should have access to the information? What are the plans yeah. around making it vice versa? Make sure everyone gets access to the data. Yeah, so with iModel, well, that's one of the reasons we're trying to do that because all you need is a browser to access iModel Hub, and you should, you know, with the right security permissions, be able to access it from any from any browser. Any supplier should be able to access the model and the BIM information, and again, from that, look up the right documentations or the right data associated with what they're they're looking at. This, you know, this this to me is a fundamental change in what we're doing. We're making this whole iModel Hub available to everybody. And I'll just note, uh, I don't know, there's a couple more there, but um, and project wise needed for everyone, or can is it a different mechanism for getting on board? Yes, all the documents are still stored within project wise. Um, and again, project wise is a network rail system, and again, providing we get access, then yeah, you know, network rail pays, pays for the cost, cost for that. Um, but yes, we yeah, and because iModel Hub is based over the top of project wise, any documents that are Storing project wise, we can make available from iModel Hub. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just go with the last one then. So, uh, I've read the, the last video seemed uh, very good for designing. How are the plans to implement that for maintenance so you can find other information when it's on track, uh, track alignments, last grind, etc.? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the whole whole thing around what we're trying to, trying to do is you know, certainly hazards, buried services design information when you're maintaining there may even be how-to videos so if you're maintaining a, a signal or points warmer or something along, along those lines you should be able to you know get exploded views you, should, you know and um and, and um procedures directly from the model just by looking and pointing at it because it because it, it ties in your geographic location and it knows where it's pointing to if you point to an object, you should be able to retrieve the information directly from the model. Okay, uh, I'll probably bring the meeting to a close. We went a little bit over, but I think it's really useful, especially the live uh, examples. Uh, so that's uh, really impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I did scri scribble down some things for a vote of thanks, but in essence, I mean, I, I started a design and working on Ink and paper. We're, we're in a different uh, ink and paper. And we're in a different world with this uh, this kind of development now. So it's uh, I'm gonna uh, so thank you very much for taking your time to present to us today, Lawrence. Yeah, it, the, the, the presentation will be uploaded on on YouTube. But if I can unmute everyone and we can just do a virtual, or uh, can we unmute everybody? Is that possible? Can you unmute your call, or, or do I need to do it? Yeah, if you unmute yourself and just give a round of applause, thank you very much. If there's any um, anything people want to follow up with with me, then yeah, please re reach out, and I'm, I'm I'm happy. Yeah, I love boring people about this this stuff. As I said before, I'm very very passionate about it. So um, yeah, please reach out. I'll, I'll be happy to help. Are your contact details around on it, Lawrence? Uh, I haven't done it, but yeah, we, 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 we should have David have to do that. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone.